previous speaker was humbled to share the stage, I'm even more humbled, and if you can, there's such a word as humbler, then I'm certainly uh, in, that, uh, in that category. Um, in July of 1976, ABC launched a program called Family Feud, and in the program, they effectively distributed a list of 100 questions uh, to an audience, sorry, a list of questions to 100 people, and got them to respond as to what were the most likely or frequent answers. Now, what does that really have to do with today's presentation? The answer really lies in the fact that I have attempted in today's preparation to try and understand what are some of the key drivers that are affecting family business, both the good and the bad, be able to prepare for you a summary thereof, and obviously want to leave with you with a set of action steps that you may want to consider at the end of today's uh, presentation. But before we get started, technology is failing me. Did somebody switch it off? Maybe not. There we go. Part here. There we go. Okay. So, um, we've gone too far. Right. The first uh, reflection point. This is big in the Middle East. Depending on what you read and the data points that you have, there's a view that says that family businesses effectively account, just so that I know, am I on this mic or this mic? I don't mind. This one. Okay. Um, family businesses account roughly non GDP. Um, I can mind. Okay. Can I use Is it on? It's on. Right. Okay. Okay. Another mic. It's all happening. Right. Okay. I'm not quite sure that happens to uh, Madonna, but we'll, uh, we'll live with it. Right. Back to the presentation. 80% of non-GDP uh, revenues, um, so non-oil GDP, comes from uh, family-owned businesses, according to some of the studies. And certainly across the GCC region, there's an expectation or a view that uh, family businesses account for an excess of $100 billion worth of annual revenue. There's a view, obviously, that family-owned businesses, as a result of that turnover and contribution to uh, economic growth, must probably employ 70% of the workforce. And in addition to that, there's a view that family businesses are key drivers of philanthropic, philanthropic endeavors across the GCC. There's also an alternative perspective on that that effectively says while being major contributors to, philanth to philanthropic in, uh, endeavors, there is little or no mechanism associated with how that is effectively seen from a return perspective. And what is even perhaps more interesting in terms of today's discussion and a lot of the conversation, both in terms of succession and diversification, is that there's an expectation of in excess of a, of a trillion dollars worth of business effectively moving from one generation to the next. That said, there's then also a consideration in terms of what we potentially can learn from family businesses. The good news is that family businesses are good at doing a couple of things. There is no doubt that when you spend family money, you are spending family money. And there are therefore invariably two key hurdles that need to get through. The first is the usual traditional hurdle associated with the likelihood on the return of an investment, etc. The second is being able to convince your peers, your colleagues, and your family members, and even your mom, that this is a good investment. Because invariably you are spending the money of the family. The second consideration is that there does tend to be a lot more frugal behavior associated with capital expenditure, particularly uh, in terms of the hurdle rates that I explained in the previous point, but also in terms of the ability in terms of how they go about effectively raising money and the ability and or willingness to spend it. There's an obviously a, there's a well-known saying that talks about the fact that we do not spend more than we earn. The third consideration in terms of family businesses is the fact that they tend to buy what they can afford. That means that if they're on the, in the process of doing acquisitions, the acquisitions tend to be very targeted. Typically, in comparison to acquisitions being made by large corporates, tend to be slightly smaller, given the risk profile. 
and at the same time, the acquisition is sometimes challenged by the, the viewpoint or theory associated with entrepreneurialism as to do I need to potentially acquire it or is there an opportunity for me potentially to grow it? And to the conversation from the previous speaker associated with you know, other endeavors but perhaps weren't key to the main business, there's obviously a need to be able to incubate those new opportunities and if they're not successful, be able to put them down and kill them. The third consideration around family businesses, and again it'll come up on the next slide, is the view associated with how well family businesses manage talent. There's a view associated with the fact that family businesses in comparison to private enterprises tend to spend more money on uh, employee development and growth. And one of the studies effectively suggests that the amount of money being spent is more than twice that of a private enterprise. There's also a view that says family businesses tend to, by their very nature, be good at employee relations and continue to hone or harvest a very employee-centric view from a behavior perspective. Now, while my dad might be better than your dad, there are obviously invariably reasons or grounds for divorce. And these are some of the challenges that one would consider within the context of a family business. There's invariably often a challenge from a family business perspective in terms of what is and how well-defined or articulated is the strategy. There's often a view that says we invariably are very entrepreneurial in our approach to life, very flamboyant potentially in terms of some of the ideas that we're prepared to entertain. But there often exists or doesn't exist a mechanism by which this corporate strategy is well-defined, outlined, and understood. The second consideration from a family business perspective is invariably trying to understand who is the boss. We've spoken at length in today's presentation around the challenges associated with succession planning but there invariably is the challenge associated with it. As the succession takes place, how does the earlier generation effectively relinquish or provide an opportunity for younger members of the family to be able to take that business and be able to grow and propel it going forward? And there often is this challenge associated with fluid governance. The operating model tends to be very paternalistic and invariably, as was one of the examples quoted earlier on today, guided by the whims or the aspirations or the decisions of the individual who potentially initially created the business and therefore is, is unwilling to potentially cede control. And the third consideration really is again to the point around talent management and perhaps juxtaposed against the previous slide, which the, is the view associated with the fact that they do struggle with employee retention and talent management because often for individuals who are growing up and developing within the organization, the opportunity for growth, the opportunity for career placement is sometimes stifled by a view in terms of being able to introduce family members into what is seen as key positions from a role perspective. So, if we're then going to consider some of the things that we might need to do to, in order to kind of keep it in the family from a succession and, and way forward perspective, here are perhaps kind of four ideas that you might want to take away with you. The first consideration is effectively being able to decide what it is that you want to be when you grow up. I think that we've heard a number of different speakers talk about their initial intent in terms of how they set about creating the business that they now effectively own and will represent. The challenge invariably is going to be what is next. Does it lie in diversification? Does it lie in an, an IPO? Does it lie in the fact of just really being happy and being able to see that investment onto the next generation? But the challenge invariably is always going to be in terms of how we are able to, def to define, communicate, and get buy-in into a strategy. If we look at some of the largest family-owned businesses, and if you take Walmart as the example, they have a very clear and very simplistic value proposition from a customer perspective. Walmart's view is that they want to be price, access, assortment, and experience conscious, which invariably means that the decisions that they make as a family group are invariably grounded against those four very principles. Does it drive us to a price competitive position? Does it effectively enhance the customer experience? Does it provide us with a price point or differential in the marketplace? And if we have failed to be able to meet any one of those four objectives as outlined in our strategy, it effectively requires us to revisit the point that is stated. The second consideration effectively is being an ability to start with the end in mind. And that really, I think, has implications for us if we consider the organizations represented here today and a consideration around the GCC as a whole. Because if the expectation is around international expansion outside of the broader GCC region, there is an introduction of a far greater regulatory regime and considerations associated with things like bribery and corruption, laws associated with the ability to do um, dealings from an ethical and business perspective, 
requirements associated with reporting, etc. And to our previous speaker's example, there's also the consideration associated that if you are in the event effectively trafficking in chemicals, for example, from a logistics perspective, there are a set of European regulations that you would have to comply with and have to be considered as part of your business plan, etc. There's also the consideration in terms of how, how you're going to go about potentially looking at the neighborhood in which you're going to operate. Defining where and how you're going to operate does have some consequences for us here in the GCC region itself. If there is a consideration associated with an ability to expand outside of the direct borders, then there are a set of structural implications that one has to consider. There's very much the view in terms of where are you going to potentially register the business and do constructs like the DIFC, for example, provide you with an opportunity for growth and also an opportunity in terms of governance. There's also that requirement associated with compliance and the ability to be able to prepare and release financial statements, et cetera, in order to be able to share those with potential joint venture partners and the associated systems and processes that are going to be required. The last consideration really is an ability or a willingness to effectively invite the neighbors over. And by that I mean to be able to look more broadly than the actual talent capability within the family owned business. Many of you, and certainly I do play with Lego, and many of you know the story that effectively said around about two, 2006, Lego itself was on the bridge of bankruptcy. It had a challenge associated with the traditional 10-year process in terms of succeeding the family business from father to son, etc., and effectively a realization that that process was no longer going to be viable. In 2006, they introduced an external party who effectively came in and was fundamental in the restructuring of Lego, to the extent today that Lego is now the largest toy brand, eclipsing the likes of Mattel and Hasbro from a capability perspective. But what that required from a family business perspective was a capability, a, an interest in ensuring the succession of the business and therefore a willingness to potentially provide or ask for advice. One of the earlier speakers spoke um, previously as well about the ability or the desire to be able to get mentorship, et cetera, that may come from a family member or it may come from an external service provider as well. But I do think that if you are going to look for ways in which you can challenge and potentially look to grow and diversify the business, that an opportunity to invite others to participate in being able to shape, guide, and steer the business has a lot of value to add. And with that, I bring my presentation to an end. Thank you so much.